Try that. Now you can probably hear me. Uh, and uh, so we're continuing our ever going study of Daniel. And for as Pastor mentioned, I am uh, doing it via the TV screens. Uh, for those at home, I, I, it looks very similar to uh, what everybody else is seeing here in the sanctuary. I uh, have a, uh, <clears throat> I'm in a situation where I have to, I run the equipment, plus I'm teaching at the same time. So it's a, uh, it's a joy for me, but it, uh, it means I have to be close to the computers. And I hope to someday get back maybe up in front, but also have to be cautious of uh, viruses. Uh, I was a heart transplant recipient, and I catch just about everything. <laughs> so it's, uh, as I guess as Paul would put it, it's a thorn in my side, but I got to deal with it. <laughs> and uh, so we pick up here in Daniel 8.15. Uh, we left off. We had talked about, uh, we had moved into a section of Daniel that I like to call the uh, prophecies to the Hebrews uh, based on a couple of things. One, based on the visions that Daniel's going to get, plus the fact that there's a lot of people who said that uh, there was a big gap between Malachi of the Old Testament and, Genesis and, uh, and Matthew of the New Testament. And what's interesting about Daniel is that uh, now it was actually all prescribed ahead of time. Uh, and it's in Daniel, and it's in the next few chapters that we're going to actually see what happens between uh, when Malachi leaves off and where Jesus picks up. And, uh, and so if you, it's kind of interesting that uh, it's not actually missing. He's looking for it in the wrong place. <laughs> but uh, so we moved into this chapter 8, which moves into the Hebrew uh, history, as Daniel is seeing it, as foretold uh, in the future. Really, Daniel is about uh, it's around the 580s uh, BC uh, period of time. And Daniel's getting these visions from God. Well, the next one we were talking about is this one in chapter 8. This is the third one that we're discussing uh, that's actually in the... Uh, let me bring up a different chart real quick so that I can uh, better describe what I'm talking about here. Okay, this chart here uh, is a little more, uh, let me do, do, actually, I'll, I'll do the full version. That way, uh, here in the sanctuary, it'll be easier to see, too. Okay. So these are the different visions we see in the actual uh, uh, book of Daniel. Uh, everybody always kind of points to chapter 2. We're talking about the, uh, the statue, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then we have uh, two more visions, and one's in chapter 7, uh, which is indicative more of the Gentile uh, period uh, prophecies going forward. And I want to point to just one major difference between chapter 7 and chapter 8. You'll notice here, in the chapter 7, uh, that uh, we're going to be talking about this little horn. And this little horn in chapter 7, you'll notice, uh, in this particular diagram, is in, uh, is in the Roman period of time. I uh, see so where it says, incompatible beast with ten horns and a little horn. So remember back to chapter 7, we were talking about ten horns and a little horn. Horn in... Uh, in the Bible is almost always represented by either a king or some kind of a uh, uh, leader, a governmental type leader. Uh, and so that, uh, and I want to notice in here in chapter 8 how it shifts. And we're going to be talking about a male goat with one great horn, four horns, and a little horn. And this little horn is what we're going to kind of uh, take a look at a little bit today in this interpretation. Because uh, this actually is symbolic of uh, a person who's going to come about, we talked about a lot last week, his name is, uh, uh, I always have a little trouble with the beginning of it, so if I look at his name, I do better. 
and Xerxes Epiphanius. Uh, <laughs> still have a lot of trouble with that name. He was a very evil king in the uh, realm of uh, uh, 175 BC to about 164 BC. Uh, so that uh, he is uh, he is going to be an evil king that the Jews have to deal with. And in chapter 8, we're going to see that that little horn they're talking about in chapter 8 is actually talking about him. It's still future to Daniel, but it is uh, different that uh, it's... But I'm also going to point out the fact that it's very symbolic of this other horn, little horn that we see in chapter 7, and that one we know to be the future Antichrist who's going to be coming someday in the future. So I just wanted to make that, that correlation there, heads up. It doesn't always stand out in the, but now you can watch for it in the uh, scripture, and you can see the slight differences there is between the two. But that one is very symbolic of the other, and particularly this one we're going to be talking about that comes out of Greece, he actually came out of Syria, is going to do a lot of the same things that the, anti, the real Antichrist is going to do later uh, in the future in the tribulation. So, let me put this back to what I had it before. One more step, almost there. Okay. So these paintings I have up here too, also are kind of symbolic of the same thing we'll be talking about. Uh, and uh, this first picture is actually talking about the uh, period of time of the uh, Mede Persian Empire. And we're going to be talking about this ram, as you can see in this picture, uh, with two horns. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to move forward to the next picture, which is talking about the Gr Grecian period of time. And again, I just, uh, these are paintings done by an individual up in, uh, I believe he lives up in Calo uh, Colorado somewhere. Pastor Silcott had introduced us to him uh, in Revelation. And he was, uh, he tries to paint paintings to teach Bible to those that maybe are having a little bit more uh, issue with hearing, uh, like for the hearing impaired, uh, that they can uh, have a symbolic vision of what the Bible is saying. Uh, and he did quite a few paintings, and this one here is on the uh, book of Daniel. I find him rather fascinating uh, because he, he does a really good job of uh, trying to depict what the, the scripture is actually saying. But the next one is going to be this one here. And this is where we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the Grecian period. And on this picture here, you can see that uh, 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 the three different visions, the first one being is uh, on the left-hand side of the picture is always talking about the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The middle picture, always symbolic of the, uh, the, the uh, vision in chapter 7, and then the right-hand side is the vision in chapter 8. So I give you an idea how the painting is kind of laid out. So let's get back to where we, let's get some verses going here. So starting in Daniel 8.15, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, that beheld, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Uh, this is a very interesting interlude here, too, is that uh, Daniel has had this vision uh, that we talked about last week. It's the vision that, uh, of, the, of the two different rams. One's, the, one's a ram and one's a he-goat. And, uh, uh, and now he's wondering about an interpretation. So uh, what seems like a pre-incarnate uh, voice from heaven of Jesus Christ uh, or God, it doesn't matter, they're both one and the same, uh, actually t instructs G Gabriel uh, to, to help Daniel to understand the vision. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And I find this, uh, I just thought, uh, 
I'd point out this, this voice uh, is quite, uh, quite common through the scriptures, and I just thought I'd pick a few other places. It's almost always talking about God the Father. Whenever we hear the voice, uh, and it happens quite a bit in the New Testament, uh, a couple of places. But before we go into that, uh, I wanted to also comment that as a messenger, Gabriel is uh, quite well known. <clears throat> And the fact that uh, it seems like he's always the messenger that's involved with the Jewish nation. So it's interesting that he pops up here in this portion of Daniel. Uh, the other places we see we see him, we'll see him in the future too, when we get to Daniel 9.21. Yea, while I speak in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning. Oh, and by the way, this is the first vision of Gabriel in the Bible. Being caused to fly swiftly, touch me about the time of the EV oblation. And he formed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Uh, so this is the next time that uh, we'll see uh, uh, Gabriel. Uh, it'll be in chapter 9. We also want to show those other places that we see Gabriel. Uh, and it always associated with the uh, Jewish uh, nation. And the most famous one is when he announced to Zechariah <coughs> over in Luke 118 that he was going to have a child named John, and we know him as John the Baptist. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And then the next famous time is when he goes and speaks to uh, uh, Mary, to let him know about Jesus. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the sea of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Very famous stories. Uh, we, I just wanted to point out that Gabriel seems to always appear as a messenger for God, for the Jewish nation. Now, talking about the voice, uh, and the voice is almost always God the Father, and uh, so we see in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, uh, this also, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight up, way out of the water, <coughs> And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon them. <clears throat> and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Boy, well, I would love to be there that day. <laughs> Can you imagine hearing that come from the sky? And that's also over in Matthew 17, 5. This is the uh, time up on the uh, <clears throat> hill there. While he yet spake, behold, a bright color overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Uh, that was a famous time where, uh, up on the Mount of Transfiguration, where uh, 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 Peter, Paul, that uh, was Peter, I'm trying to think, there was three people up there, Andrew, Simon, and Peter. Uh, I, I'm, I'd have to refresh my memory on that. Actually, it's right here. Peter, James, and John uh, witnessed uh, the same thing up on the Mount Transfiguration. And just one more incident. Uh, Peter actually confirms this too over in 2 Peter 1, 17 and 18. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when they came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. So, more verification of this particular incident, and that we can see this goes all the way back to Daniel. Uh, when God first did it, we know that he did it quite a bit with Ezekiel, uh, over in, uh, in, those, in those particular visions of his. So anyways, back to Daniel 8.17. <laughs> so he came near where I stood. So this is the uh, uh, Gabriel now. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. Well, I think uh, most of us probably would uh, if all of a sudden this, uh, you hear this voice out of the heavens, this man is approaching you, uh, who this person in the heavens just, uh, just talked about. I would pretty much think that it was God in the person, too, and he dropped to my face. Uh, finishing this verse, I was afraid and fell upon my face, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be this vision. Well, some of this 
terminology is going to sound very similar uh, to what we heard in chapter 7 about the Antichrist. So it's to the time of the end, but you got to really focus on the fact that we're talking about Daniel, and for him, all of this is forward. Uh, even though for us, and what I love about this is that all this can be verified by history, so we know that these visions that Daniel got actually did happen. So that's proof positive that anything we haven't seen happen yet from Daniel, uh, really, uh, we can look forward to the fact that it will happen 100% uh, as it's stated. Verse 18, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Med, Media, and Persia. <clears throat> now, if I just flip back to Daniel 8.3 when we first saw this, and we saw last week, then I lifted up mine eyes and saw and beheld there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were, were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And what that's talking about is actually there was two rulers during that period of time they're very noteworthy, one from Persia and one from Mede. And what he's saying here is that, uh, let's go back to verse 20. <coughs> so again, I guess I had mentioned this is talking about the Mede-Persian Empire. Uh, that empire ran from 539 to 331 B.C. So about a little over a little over 200 years. And it's uh, talking here mainly about the first two, but also a, another one is going to come into play. Well, no, no, actually, that's Greece. And that one was dominant over the other. And in this particular case, the dominant one at first was Medes. And then Persia, the king of Persia, came up after that. And uh, as a little history note, uh, Darius the Mede was the first one, uh, and we see him uh, spoken about in the Bible. Uh, I'll mention a few places here in a minute that's talked about. And then Cyrus the Great from Persia was the second. And there was more after that. Obviously, we're talking about a 200-year uh, period of time. And as we edit, head into the Ezra and Nehemiah time frame, uh, we see Cyrus the second, Darius the first, uh, Xerxes, uh, these are all mentioned over in Ezra, uh, and, and Xerxes uh, was another one in Ezra 7. Uh, that's also mentioned, the one that's mentioned in Esther, the one one. So these are some of the kings of the Mede-Persians, and this will give you the basic time frame we're talking about here. So during this time frame, uh, all these different books of the Bible were written, and that uh, the temple was rebuilt uh, in Jerusalem under uh, Nehemiah, and well, actually, he did rebuilt the city. So we can see that the, these particular uh, visions that Daniel had did come to tr uh, fruition, even down to the detail of which king came first by the position of the horns. Uh, I find that very fascinating. Then we move into the next kingdom, uh, which is the uh, Gr Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire went from about 331 BC to about 168 BC. Uh, and it starts off with Alexander the Great, uh, who was represented by this one horn. And let me bring this. And in this particular picture, you'll see him over here uh, in the bottom here uh, with one horn. Or by, I should say, the great horn. There's going to be other horns that come up behind it. Then, and let's move on here to verse 22, and it says, now then, that being broken, so that horn is going to be broken in this vision, whereas four stood up from it, for it. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. Very interesting prophecy, because actually what happened with Alexander, he was so swift in taking over the known world at that time, that he actually got very depressed. He wanted more, he wanted to conquer more kingdoms, and there wasn't any. Uh, and so he got so depressed, he actually committed suicide. Uh, so that 
four of his generals took over after him. And so you can see here in Daniel's vision, uh, that, uh, but not in his power, meaning it wasn't by his thought process that these four rulers would stand up. Uh, it was basically by attrition uh, that those four rulers uh, stood up. I find all this very fascinating that uh, it was so accurate. Those four kingdoms that stood up uh, were four generals of Alexander's army. Uh, and the four they're talking about here is Macedonia, uh, that was under the general Cassander. Uh, Syria was under Seleucus. Uh, Egypt was uh, under uh, Polonomy the first, and Asia Minor was under Lysimachus. And of course, after they, because uh, because because it went on for quite a few years, it went on for from 331 BC to 168 BC, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, but the uh, these four rulers, uh, of course, had other people behind them. I didn't I didn't get a complete list. It's quite a long list with the different rulers of those different areas, but it broke up into four areas. And that's what's represented uh, by the four horns that we're going to talk about here. Daniel 8.23, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. What a fascinating sentence. King of fierce continents, very evil, and understanding dark sentences, another very interesting term. I couldn't help but think about the fact that the first time I read that, the first thing that came to mind, of course, Daniel didn't have the previ that we do, was Ephesians 6.12. And I just point that out. Uh, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So that's what I'm going to kind of point to here is that the fierce continence in understanding dark sentences, who is the man behind the man? And uh, I truly believe it's Satan, and, that, uh, and Satan is going to be the power behind this uh, forerunner of the Antichrist. Uh, and so that's why a lot of people point to this and see it symbolically as, the, uh, as a, uh, a pre-vision of the Antichrist. And again, we, like we uh, mentioned before, we're talking about a man called uh, Anaxerxes Epiphanius. Uh, he was the, uh, one of the four Greek kings that stood up uh, of the Seleucid Empire, which would be basically where Syria is now, who reigned over Syria from 175 BC to 164 BC. Uh, this is the period of time we're talking about. He is famous for almost conquering Egypt, so it looks like he even went back at, after one of his own former fellow generals uh, there in Egypt, and for his brutal, brutal persecution of the Jews, uh, which participated in the Maccabean uh, uh, revolt. And we, we discussed that in length last week. I won't bring it up again. Uh, but uh, here and in chapter 11, when we will be taking a closer look at uh, this king as a type of the Antichrist uh, coming in the future tribulation spoken about in Daniel 9, which we'll talk about a lot when we get into Daniel 9. So there's three actual interpretations, and I think they actually represent all three, of uh, this particular dark figure, uh, the fierce continence person we see here. And the three are basically that some of the commentaries I was reading. Uh, King of the north of Syria, that's obvious, uh, and that's spoken about over in Daniel 11.40. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come up against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. This is that part that we're just mentioning that he may have already uh, he, he attempted to take over Egypt. Another version says that he's the Roman beast of Daniel 7, 23 and 24. I'll just read through that. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. There's a problem I have with this version. I can see it as a sim symbolic uh, idea, but it can't be the same person, because we're talking the difference between four kingdoms and ten kingdoms. So this is a big difference between the two. 
verse 25 of that passage, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall so wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. This is the other area uh, that we're going to see is different with this particular uh, version of the little horn. Uh, so I wanted to kind of show the difference between Daniel's version and what we're going to be seeing here shortly. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it until the end. I believe that is completely talking about the Antichrist of the, uh, of the uh, tribulation, not this particular little horn here in chapter 8. Back to chapter 8, verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So we kind of see a little bit of a correlation there between uh, what we saw in chapter 7 and chapter 8, but not quite the same. Uh, he is going to destroy the mighty and holy people. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, the Maccabean revolt, many thousands of uh, Jews were killed during that whole thing. And that uh, uh, the persecution was really, really bad. Uh, this particular uh, uh, Epiphanes, I need to get better at pronouncing that name. And Xerxes Epiphanes was probably uh, the most evil king ever seen in uh, Jewish history. Uh, and so that that's why it stands out in history for them. And as I mentioned last week, they actually celebrate defeating him uh, by Hanukkah uh, or the Maccabean revolt where a few strong uh, uh, people stood up against his government and actually beat him off. But of course, uh, I think most people believe that God was behind that, not just uh, not just their own power. So I thought I'd just mention a few things about who is actually behind this leader. Uh, and uh, of course, we're talking about Satan here. And Put a verse in here again. And I kind of point to this verse in 2 Thessalonians 2 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Uh, kind of point to that verse as that uh, Satan is always behind these world leaders uh, trying to do his bidding. And sometimes he uses uh, different techniques. All through history, we see different times when uh, Satan has used multiple different techniques. And a passage that comes to mind when I was reading this, uh, I couldn't help but does. It's kind of a quick history lesson of this, uh, of the whole series of time of how Satan is behind trying to destroy the Jews. And that's the ultimate goal by Satan, is if he can stop God's plan. Uh, first, he tried stopping uh, Jesus from being born in many different ways. Uh, and now he's, uh, he's kind of, uh, that's kind of like past history. And now he's moving forward to try to do uh, damage in other ways uh, by causing the Jews not to believe that the Messiah, uh, who the Messiah is. Now we're in Revelation 12. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, chapter. I'm going to try to read through all 17 verses and kind of end there, I think. Uh, but that, uh, I think this is really symbolic of exactly Satan's whole drive through this period of time. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Uh, that represents Israel. And she being with child, cried tra travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Uh, that's the original birth of Jesus Christ because he came out of the nation of Israel. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Dragon in Revelation always represents Satan, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, who to devour her child as soon as it was born. That was originally how he uh, tried to stop uh, Jesus from being born in the first place. You remember the uh, 
uh, Herod there had all the babies killed under two years old. Uh, and, uh, and there's many other examples of times that he tried to stop Jesus from being born. I believe the whole Noah flood uh, thing was uh, another attempt to try to stop Jesus from being born. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now again, this is talking about Jesus still, and we know he sits on the right hand of the Father now on his throne. So this is all past history. Now we're going to kind of go into the future. Now we're going into the revelation, uh, into the tribulation period. And the woman fled, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against, uh, and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That particular portion, even though I know uh, Satan still has access to heaven right at this point, at some point he's going to actually be thrown out of heaven permanently, where he's not allowed back at all. And I believe that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. That's what he's doing right now. Uh, that pretty much Satan is spending his whole time complaining about us. That we uh, do this or we do that. And uh, when we have our, uh, our, our uh, intercessor known as Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, that is there standing beside him going, uh-uh, he's one of mine. No, nope, he's covered by the blood. I uh, can't touch him. And so that's pretty much what's going on day in and day out in front of, in front of uh, God right at this time. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he hath known he has but a short time. Again, this is the latter part of the tribulation where this happens. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So he's going to be under heavy, heavy persecution of the Jews. And that's why I'm bringing up this passage, because I want you to realize that uh, Satan has not given up yet. Uh, he, if he can eliminate the Jews from doing one thing, and that is to call Jesus back to the earth at the end of the tribulation, then he still wins. And I believe that's uh, what he's trying to do now. And to the women who given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Uh, this is, again, all attempts by Satan to destroy these people fleeing uh, during the midway way point of the tribulation. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I believe that's talking about those that managed to survive through the tribulation and to keep their testimony uh, clean and don't take the mark of the beast. So I just wanted to point to... Uh, something that Jesus said. Coming up here, we're going to celebrate that period of time here shortly. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus made a proclamation that has to come true. And I believe this is what Satan is trying to do uh, all through history, is to stop this from happening. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That basically happened in 70 AD. They haven't had a, uh, a place to worship, a temple since then. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, this particular uh, prophecy was first spoken of in Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, 
and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So if the Jews, so if there isn't at least one Jew left at the end of the tribulation to say this, Jesus cannot come back. So I think that Satan is still at work trying to, uh, to bring this about and uh, world events coming uh, uh, even now kind of uh, really make me curious as to how close we are really getting to that period of time. So just to finish up uh, this particular vision in Daniel 8.25. Through his policy also he, cause, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. That one verse me, to me has two fulfillments. Uh, it's mainly talking about uh, epiphanies, but it's also talking, I believe, about the uh, uh, Antichrist of the future. We see that in Revelation 6, 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. He went forth conquering and to conquer. So that, uh, uh, I guess finish up Daniel here, we're running out of time. I had a few other verses, but uh, uh, maybe I'll save them for another future time. I guess finish up this chapter, uh, this, this chapter. And the vision of this evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut up thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And, Dan and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days afterward. I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. And I think as we move forward here that we are definitely coming to a time that we're seeing more and more how a lot of these different prophecies are, uh, are manifesting themselves. And so it's exciting time, uh, but uh, I'll end there. And uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord, I just love it so much that uh, you gave us so much information to see, to look into the future. And you're helping us to understand, particularly as we come through this time frame, how... Uh, how your prophecies are 100% accurate. Uh, there isn't a single one that ever did not come to fruition. So we also look forward to the future prophecies, Lord, that uh, as we move forward, that you can help us uh, to help others to see uh, what you have already told us in your, in your Bible. Uh, and we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Fascinating times, uh, I tell you. It's like every time I read some of this stuff, I'm thinking I'm reading the newspaper at the same time. <laughs> but we'll be digging into that a little bit more too as we move into chapter 10 main, mainly. So that's why I'm, uh, uh, if, there's, if there's any questions, uh, start formulating some of them now. We can get them to them later. Yeah. Mede and Persia. Persia. Yep. Actually, uh, uh, it's pretty much uh, Iran. Iran. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the Medes actually moves a little bit more towards uh, India. Uh, if you've ever studied Esther, Esther actually took place in, in, in like the... Uh, Western part of India. So it's that base, same basic area, the Babylonian Empire area. Uh, so uh, a little bit of Iraq, Iraq, Iran uh, is what the current countries are today. Good morning, Tuck. 